Hello, and I'd like to welcome you to the Commissioner's Corner for Oakland County, and I'm Kathy Crawford, and I am the Oakland County Commissioner for District 9. Today we have a very interesting program, and a lot of people have asked me questions about Detroit Water and Sewer. So uh, before I introduce the guest that's going to tell us all we ever really didn't want to know about Detroit Water and Sewer, um, I just want to give you a little bit of background about Detroit Water and Sewer, just so you have general information. One of the things that um, a lot of people maybe don't realize that Detroit Water uh, goes back to the actually 1700s and the early 1800s, the water system, where they had a water system of logs, and then the sewage system came afterwards, and it was made up of bricks and stone. And I wouldn't be surprised, but that they still aren't using some of that. Um, actually, the Detroit Water and Sewer Department provides uh, services to uh, the entire city of Detroit as well as 127 communities within the counties of uh, Wayne, Oakland, Macomb, St. Clair, Genesee, Washtenaw, um, and Washtenaw. So there's 127 communities, and as I said, this makes actually this makes up also about 40% of the state of Michigan's population. So the fresh water comes to Detroit water and sewer from Lake Huron to the north and from the Detroit um, River to the south. The wastewater treatment is provided to 70, uh, 76 communities within um, the same municipalities and there's over 3,433 uh, sewer lines in the system. So by law, Detroit Water and Sewer can only recover costs for the provision of services, and it cannot make a profit. They have approximately 1,600 employees, and the budget for 2013 and 14 is $380.6 million. So now I'd like to introduce you to a very special guest that I'm very proud and honored to have with us, Gerald Poison, JD, huh. and that's Juris Doctor. Doctor, yes. Well, Jerry is not only a uh, deputy for Oakland County, but he is the chief deputy county executive. And he's been chief of s several different things. So I just want to tell you, just so you don't think he's some crackpot or something or other that doesn't know what he's talking about, I want to give you a little bit about um, his background. But first, Jerry, tell me, how many deputies are there in Oakland County? There are five. Only five? Only five. And yeah. you're the chief of those five? That's correct. Okay. And um, I, I know when I was reading your bio and every said, it said that you went to Michigan State University where you had a, you got a bachelor's degree in criminal justice and administration. Correct. And very high honors, it also said in your bio. And one thing that I did not know about you and I was kind of surprised to see was that you were a special agent and a criminal investigator. Is that right? For That's a little correct. while you did that? Uh, for, yes, for the U.S. Treasury Department, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Um, we did uh, explosives investigation and gun investigations primarily. Did that prepare you for Oakland County, you think? <laughs> it was a different did experience. It was a wonderful experience, but it wasn't the best lifestyle if you wanted to have a family and children. Yeah, I understand that. And so then you went to work for uh, the Attorney General's office or in the Attorney General's office as, um, what did you do there? Um, well, I worked for the Prosecuting Attorney's Coordinating Council and we basically wrote uh, training manuals for prosecutors' offices in the state. Okay. Then you became a chief there, assistant, a chief assistant prosecutor, is that right? Well, I became a prosecutor after law school. The, the Attorney General job was a job during law school. And after law school, I became a, an assistant prosecutor for Oakland County and uh, ultimately uh, uh, became chief assistant prosecutor, yes. Wow. And then you became a deputy county executive in 1999. Um, and then you were the deputy chief starting in 2009, the deputy, deputy chief of the Oakland County. I mean, you were the, what is it? What is it exactly? I became the chief Explain deputy chief in deputy. 2009. <laughs> <laughs> right. I actually left the prosecutor's office in 94 to become the corporation counsel for the county. Corporation and then counsel. And became a, a, a deputy county executive in about 1999. Okay. Yeah. Well, you've had a very busy... And in the midst of all this, you had what? Six children? Six children, yes. Yeah. I don't know how you had time for that, really. It doesn't you seem like you were home very much. Got a great spouse. <laughs> I'm sure you do. You would have to. 
Okay, of all the jobs that you've had, what do you think has been the most challenging job? Well, I think uh, the, the job I currently have is the most challenging because it has the widest scope. Uh, we do uh, everything at the county, you know, from law enforcement that you've heard about, but mm -hmm. you know, we do public health and we do personnel and there's parks, there's risk management. There's just a wide array of topics you can get involved with on any given day. And so um, making sure that you have enough wisdom to know when to go to experts in other areas and to become involved yourself is, is a challenge, but I love it. Well, I think one of the things that, that Brooks L. Brooks Patterson, our county executive, has really been a master at is really appointing the right people for the right jobs in his administration. You know, no one person can do all this by themselves. So you really have to have people behind you. And with just the five of you, uh, deputies, and then there's department heads, I assume then, uh, that fall uh, under your expertise or whatever. So I think probably he's really been masterful at appointing the right people because everybody I've ever run into that's a deputy or in the administration seems brilliant. And I know you're not gonna argue with me <laughs> on that, well, right? I thank you for that, but I, we do have a great team and uh, I think we're dedicated. We've been together a long time now, which of course is one of the signs that you've, you've picked some good people who, who work hard together and uh, we're thrilled to keep going. Everybody seems like they don't think of it as a job. It's, it's their life, you know. It's what they really are passionate about, serving the county and um, serving this administration. So um, how did you come to actually be involved with Detroit Water and Sewer it, under the auspices of what your job as chief is? I mean, maybe you can tell me a little bit about what your primary um, things are that you handle day to day as the chief. Well, what, First. what I tell you specifically, and it gets into that, the county executive under the, the Act 139, which is our law mm -hmm. um, governing Oakland County's uh, organization, is responsible for joint planning uh, with other jurisdictions, responsible for preparing plans for the overall development of the county that ultimately go to you on the Board of Commissioners for adoption or modification. Mm -hmm. um, for public education and information programs, it's the entire executive branch and so when the city of Detroit called us and said that they wanted to talk about creating an authority to take over the operation of the Detroit water and sewer system um, they called the county executive's office as well as the water resources office because the water resources office of course is your agent on existing water and sewer systems but the county executive is responsible for the overall really? plans and for the representation on joint planning efforts. And that's how we got in this per current conversation. So about how long then have you been dealing with this Detroit water sewer issue? And I know there's other things too, transportation, you've been very much involved mm -hmm. in the whole regional transportation program. And are there other large issues like that that you've also been sitting in on those meetings? and? kind of learning about it, I guess? I, when I first became a deputy, um, I did a lot of the environmental uh, infrastructure issues, and that is transportation. It's a little bit roads, although let me point out very Everything. quickly, we're not responsible for roads as the right. county government. The Road Commission is under state law. Um, but those are the type of large regional projects that, that we've been involved in and that I've been involved in personally. And so in addition to overseeing the law department and and the Human Resources Department and Risk Management, Insurance and those things, I do the uh, uh, regional uh, infrastructure issues as well. So I would presume at five o'clock you're not looking at your watch saying, I, I gotta go now. No, right? the, you know, once yeah. the world invented uh, pagers, iPads and phones, you don't <laughs> escape anymore. You do not, I know. Well, um, we've been hearing for years now or several years that uh, there have been problems you know, maybe even, uh, you know, there was corruption or mismanagement or whatever with Detroit water and sewer. So let's just get right into that. Um, are you aware of what some of those problems that were sort of rearing up when that came about and what was it exactly and how did it affect us in the suburbs? Well, the uh, United States government filed suit back in 1977, I believe, against really? the Detroit Water and Sewer Department for failure to comply with the Clean Water Act. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the counties, as customers, 
became involved in that suit. And that litigation lasted until 2013. From the 1970s? From 1977 through 2013, oh my goodness. the system was under the jurisdiction of the federal court. Really? Um, and so under the guise of that litigation, the county customers, we'll call them wholesale customers because that's what they're called in the system, okay. um, bought any number of issues forward to the courts um, whenever they felt aggrieved. You know, we don't like how you're setting rates. We're paying for other people's water usage. You know, those kind of issues, who needs to pay what, when, and where, uh, have dominated uh, for a long time. Charges that uh, different administrations in the city would try and push off onto the suburban customers. Uh, there was a lot of litigation on those type of issues. So this predates me, and, and unfortunately, I think after I'm done in my term in office, there will be issues related to uh, the proper allocation of resources and who pays for what within the water system and sewer hmm. system. I know, it just seemed like there was a lot of it. We found out not very long ago about this mismanagement or, you know, it was, I don't know, I guess they've gotten rid of a lot of those administrators now. Is that your understanding? That Well, not, not obviously, I mean, some of them were prosecuted and went to prison. So there oh, was corruption. Well, there All right, that's, that's not a guess. Um, in terms of business practices, the, the new management right now admits that there's probably 50% or more overstaffed. Overstaffed. I, overstaffed. So if and you they can't will, just get rid of these overstaffed people. Well, or? this is uh, you know there's collective bargaining agreements. There's ah. uh, any number of issues as you go forward, and of course you have to figure out who really isn't needed anymore. And part of running an efficiently managed system means that you keep the system up so you could use technology to reduce your labor costs. Well, there's not been a lot of um, proactive maintenance or improvements in the system for a couple of decades unfortunately wow. so those are the problems that are coming to light now or at least coming to the point where they just absolutely have to be addressed because the system in places is falling apart well i heard our county executive say that the state of the county message something about um, the fact that they there's even some places where there are wood pipes underground well, that's right. what we keep being told we know that there's at least infrastructure relating back to the 1880s uh, throughout the city. Remember, there's 3,400 miles of water transmission and delivery pipes just inside the city. Wow. Um, so you're really talking they're probably about probably under streets and big buildings and oh, who knows yes, what else. Oh, yes, they're all buried. They're yeah. underground. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're very expensive to get to, very expensive to replace. Yeah. Um, so yes, just in the city alone, there's that much. They have another 400 miles of what they call transmission pipes that go out into the suburbs. And then from those transmission pipes are where the local systems take over. And there's thousands and thousands of miles throughout of pipes throughout the residential communities that are being so served. So the communities, the customers, the wholesale customers then, are they providing their own um, pipes or, keep, or maintaining their own pipes then? Yes, think of it as a, as a retail system. Um, when the water comes in to the communities, it's a wholesale. That's why we're wholesale customers. The cities, if you will, will buy the water in bulk and then they distribute it to the individual houses. Your water bill is the charge that your city has for both their system and then what they pay for the wholesale product that comes to you. Thank goodness in Nova, I still have a well and septic. Okay. I never thought it was a great thing to have uh, at the time, but now I'm thinking, okay, maybe yeah. that's not such a bad thing. But let me be the first to tell you, that's not gonna get you off the hook. Oh, it's there's, there's a million two hundred and twelve thousand people, I think, in Oakland County these days, the last census. A million three thousand people are on either water and sewer or both with the DWSD. You can't have a healthy community unless um, that system thrives. And you're going to be paying more in taxes for other things. You're going to lose your property mm -hmm. value for your existing home if the system doesn't work for you too. You're not going to have the businesses. Even, so even if we're not even a part of that system, right. we're still going to end up paying something. Yeah, you're not going to pay the direct costs in the form of a bill, but when employers decide they're not going to locate here because they can't get water or sewer services at a reasonable rate, you're going to end up paying more taxes for your local community service because you're going to have fewer taxpayers. Oh my goodness, wow. Well, and now they, did they have a board before that kind of would oversee or was it an yes. advisory board? They've, what was it they've like? always had a board of water commissioners. Okay. And what happened in the course of the litigation we talked about and relatively recently um, during uh, Mayor Bing's time mm -hmm. in office, 
uh, through the court, they established that the seven member board, there would be three members who were still appointed by the mayor of the city of Detroit, but each county would have the ability to nominate a representative to be appointed. And so Oakland County nominated a, an individual named Brian Williams, who's, mm -hmm. if you will, our representative on the Detroit Water Board. Um, but he's still appointed by the mayor of the city of Detroit. And the city has four votes and the suburban wholesale customers have three and that's the current system right now. So do you think the feeling was at the time, oh wow, this is really good, we've got representation now, everything is gonna start to improve? Well, it was certainly an improvement because then mm -hmm. you had somebody you could ask as a, a member of a board, uh, like you are, mm -hmm. you can ask us what's going on in the county and various departments and we have an obligation to tell you. Well, now we had board members duly appointed that can ask some harder questions of the the management of the water and sewer system and hopefully get answers and and it's been working somewhat hmm, somewhat okay so there's there's some new administration now or people that are in the leadership administratively anyway and we have these board members um, and so I guess um, you know I just saw that there was a they had a two, 2013 uh, capital improvement program and they were going to start to replace these aging um, mains, water mains, and they were gonna rehab some of the plants as well as replace sewer lines. That was in the plan, the capital improvement plan. And they had budgeted $1.4 billion for the next four years. Now, is, that's a separate issue, isn't it? From the money now that's in arrears that they're trying to get us to pay, or is that all lumped together? Well, it's really all related, of course, because you get the money to operate any business from your sales revenue, right? Yeah. right? The way the Detroit Water and Sewer System gets its money is it charges rates to customers. Customers pay the bills, and out of that money, those revenues, you pay for capital improvement and maintenance, you pay for chemicals, salaries, fringe benefits, all of the costs associated with the business. And, uh, and there's the crux of one of the problems are that the revenue that they budget, they never realize and haven't for years. You're talking about a system that's, that's lost $1.5 billion in structural operating losses over the last seven years. So Wait a minute, say that again. Now in uh, seven yeah. years they have lost so, uh, how much? $1.5 billion. Billions, see I can't even billion. comprehend Billion, it's a lot of money. Yeah. And a large segment of it uh, half a billion of it was to get out of some disastrous swap deals. We've all been hearing the term swap deals, which are basically uh, borrowings where you you risk uh, interest rate fluctuations. You know, you're taking a bet. If mm -hmm. interest rates go up, you win your bet. If they go down, you lose your bet badly. So it's like a wild-eyed guess? <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Well, you would hope. I'm not sure how much us as local officials get to really compete against Wall Street bankers who do this every day um, when you're making your bet. Um, but they, they did some swap arrangements, didn't pay it out. They wrote off over half a billion dollars um, in 2012 to get out of some of those swap arrangements charged to the ratepayers of the water and sewer system. So that's a half a billion dollars that we pay throughout the future because it's over time that we got no value for. There's Another, nothing. There's no nothing. service. There's nothing. No, no. That's just, it was a bad bet we lost, so we do that. There's another half billion dollars in what they call discontinued projects. So what that means is they were going to do a project. So they incurred costs like for like inch. A, a They're new... going to build a new main. They're going to build okay. a sewage treatment holding center. Okay. Some kind of project where they were going to do it. They incurred costs. They borrowed money to do it. And now they've called it off. And when I say now they've called it off, maybe they called it off five years ago and the new management's just finally catching up to the accounting because old management ignored it. Um, but they, they wrote off another half a billion dollars over that seven year time frame in bad bets. So wow. um, that's, that's the lion's share of what they've lost. And uh, the, now we're at 150, 200 million dollars a year in unrealized revenues, losses from just operations. So the system's hemorrhaging money, and out of that money, get back to your, your capital improvement plan, you charge a 4% rate increase is what the theory is, and that's somehow gonna raise enough money to take care of these new costs and the old costs. It's not, not working, it's not gonna work, it's just math, no. 
It's one of the problems we've had in these authority negotiations. I, you know, I think people for a long time just really didn't pay, as long as they can turn on their faucet and something comes out, you know, and they can flush the toilet or whatever, they just haven't really paid too much attention to it. But, you know, it seems like every other week, and I, I had a couple pages from Sunday's uh, Detroit Free Press, all of a sudden, you know, water, why not strike a deal that benefits our entire region and water, quick private bidding, you know, all of this information and everything that now I think is getting homeowners a little bit more, um, not interested necessarily, but a little bit more nervous about what's going on. Um, so I guess to go back to the, now we're at the place where the emergency manager comes into the picture, right? right? And uh, Kevin Orr. So how did this dynamic change? Now that Kevin Orr is in place, what has changed with the Detroit, in relationship anyway, the Detroit Water and Sewer? Well, the, the city manager, excuse me, the emergency manager speaks for the city. Okay. And so the, the real change was not only the appointment of the manager, but they filed for bankruptcy. All right, so in bankruptcy, the, the city has $18 billion in debt are what is reported. Six billion of that debt is related to the water and sewer system. Um, Six billion of the of the eighteen, 18. yes, wow, of, is related to the water and sewer system. And so the counties were approached um, by the emergency managers team. In June is when we were invited into the conversation. This past June. This right. past June, uh, with the idea of if we use existing law and create an authority, we can give you the suburbs operating control of the authority through the board in exchange for a payment, a lease payment. And on so, the surface, did that seem well, on the like surface, a plan? It, uh, it's a great That's idea good. to explore. It's been done in other places. It's successful um, in other places. Uh, so we said, yes, th let's sit down and talk about it. Well, that was June. The first real numbers came out in October, on October 2nd to be exact. Uh, they came forward with a proposal that would uh, have an authority be formed and the suburban customers would in exchange for the operating control on the governing board um, would pay in, 19, in 2015 they would pay something in the neighborhood of 94 million dollars the first year as a lease payment and that lease payment would grow every year for the next eight until you got to 228.6 million dollars a year in a lease payment and then that payment would grow for the next 31 years by the greater of 4% or CPI, Consumer Price Index. So that was their opening gambit. And we said, you've got to be kidding, no. I mean, uniformly, Wayne said no, Oakland said no, Macomb said no, that's ridiculous. Here we have a system that needs work. A lot and, of work, And you right? want to take not only money out of the system, you want to take an enormous amount of money out of the system to handle other needs in the city. We don't argue that the city doesn't have things that aren't even needs. related to water yes, yeah. to the customers. You right? know, if you want to be nice, you say they need it for for fire and police. If you want to be less than nice, you say they want it for the staff support for the city council or for the Manoogian Mansion or for whatever. The bottom line is the city legitimately needs money, but that doesn't make it the job of the water and sewer customers no. No. to pay for the city of Detroit operations. In their own cities, they pay taxes to pay for the services they get from their city government. That's what Detroit's missing and that's what they're desperately trying to seek a way to recover. So they want us to pay them and they're not really gonna tell us what they're gonna use the money for, but it's not gonna really be, be related to the service that we're buying, correct? Absolutely, that's exactly that's, right. Oh. And the theory is that you could afford it. The system could afford this, it would be rate neutral. And what does rate neutral mean? It means you could do it within the existing rates that are being charged, albeit, they plan on charging increases of 4% a year for the next 10 years. And within that money, you could make all these payments and the systems could still operate. And we said, well, wait a minute, the system's not operating successfully today. Yeah. If you do the math on these bills that aren't being covered, 4% doesn't cover what's happening today, even before you make a lease payment. So not only no, heck no, Mm -hmm. And uh, so then in December, they came back with a new, a new plan. And the new plan was, all right, we're, we're going to have a, a lease payment that uh, we hear you complaining about taking money out of the system. So only $44 million will go to the city for other things. 
23 will go to the city, but in a reserve account to pay for capital improvements and the city's retail system, that 3,400 miles that needs work. And we'll save all this money because we're gonna, all these things are going to be fixed once the authority takes over. You know, you're not going to have extra employees. You're not going to have high borrowing costs because, look, it'll be, it'll be remote from the city of Detroit. They call it bankruptcy remoteness. The Wall Street will say, oh, you're not with the city anymore. We're going to give you a better rate. Um, mm. So we looked at that. And that's December 17th, I remember, because um, I went to a meeting. So I'd taken my wife out to dinner for our anniversary. There you go. Um, so then on, on January, in January 15th, we sat down again. And lo and behold, they had, a, they had a similar proposal. This time the lease payment was up to $47 million a year. Um, and then the uh, DWSD ratepayers would get the privilege of assuming also a billion dollars in unfunded pension liabilities. We'd still pay what most people don't know we're already paying, which they call it a rate of return subsidy. We pay millions of dollars each year to the city in the form of a subsidy for their residents in exchange for the fact that they own the city and they take the risk of ownership. That's now $29 million already built in. So it's the lease payment plus the rate of return subsidy, $29 million, plus you're going to assume the unfunded uh, liabilities with respect to pension. Um, and then there was other justifications. How did you get the $47 million? Well, um, we're going to relieve you of the obligation to pay the retirees health care. And that's worth X amount of dollars. And we're going to defease these pension bonds that are out there called certificates of participation. Mm -hmm. um, Cops, there was about $15 right. million dollars in value on that. They're paying about $17 million dollars, uh, a year with respect to health care, the pay as you go health care. And so let's see, 15 and 17, that's 47. Well, it's not, but it's close enough. Just take 47. 47 became their number. And where that number really comes from, in our opinion, in my opinion, is all during this time, they've been in New York City. Having, back at Wall Street. Uh, back at Wall Street, <laughs> yeah. the people who are old billions, they're trying to hammer out settlements. And to make whatever their plan is for some of these to work, they need $47 million a year. And that's how they arrived at that figure, which we've been told throughout is a floor, meaning it can't go down. It can go up. go up. It can go up. Um, that uh, um, you there's not going to be a cap on it. Or no, anything there's like not going to be a cap on it. And uh, so it's a floor. And by the way, the 40-year lease can never be terminated, not even for a breach, not even if we don't pay you, not even if you don't pay us, it can't be terminated for a breach. And in reality, it's a perpetual lease because it continues as long as there's outstanding capital bills hmm. to pay. And by the nature of any utility, you're always repairing pipes. Sure. You're always building new pollution control facilities. Which they should facilities. have been doing years and years, decades correct, ago. Correct, correct. Right? Um, so it's a, per, a lease in per, perpetuity. It's a payment in perpetuity. There is a mechanism, of course, to increase the payment after 40 years, but there's nothing to reduce it hmm. in their proposal. And we said no to that as well. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure that our viewing audience, their eyes are probably glazing over. We're talking millions, we're talking billions, and they can't really, you know, it's hard for anybody to kind of wrap their arms around the kind of debt. We do, the, I, I've heard you say before that we can't even determine how much debt there is. I mean, that the water department, how much, how much there is. We don't even know. They don't even know, no. right? We know debt. Uh, I guess what I was trying to say when I was explaining that to you is we don't know the depth of the need the for the capital improvement. Ah. There's 3,400 miles of pipe just under the city. What condition is it in? How much do you need to rehab it over the next 40 years so it can still work? Um, I think our local communities have a much better handle. You know, you've spent millions sure. of dollars in Oakland County to, uh, yep. to create systems so our communities can, you put a TV camera in a pipe actually physically and you sure. take pictures and you try and figure out what needs to be repaired and when. You have preventive maintenance schedules and you do it. The city ran into a problem as soon as they ran into financial difficulty. They had bond covenants, promises inside their, their loan documents that said that they would keep revenues in a certain ratio to expenses. And remember I said the revenues never come in the way they're budgeted for yeah. lots of reasons, they just haven't. So in any given year, to keep that ratio going so their bonds don't get called, they have to control expenses. Well, you control expenses by not doing the capital improvements. Well, 
if you scheduled $100 million in improvements in a year because that's what you needed because pipes were collapsing and they're old, and then decide you can't do that because of the bond covenants and only spend 30, that means 70 million of that need gets rolled over to the next year. Hmm. And the work doesn't get done and the system falls deeper into disrepair. And then if you do that for, oh, I don't know, 15 or 20 years consecutively, you have this big mess that we currently have. Yeah. You know, I, I know Oakland County really has done a great job in budgeting, you know, under Brooks's leadership and all the administration involved in it. And we have, uh, we have a balanced budget up to 2016, correct? Correct. Yeah. And so it's balanced up to 2016. Now, have they ever balanced a budget? I mean, maybe not. I don't know if the department itself has ever really um, even been audited for years and years, well, right? Well, certainly they do have an audit performed every year pursuant to Michigan law. They're late sure. right now, yeah. Yeah. all right? But remember that balancing a budget on paper is easy. Yeah. It's the implementation of the budget. Now, what they do that's unique, as far as we can tell, is when their Board of Water Commissioners just did a budget, they did a budget where they did a budget to budget. Here's what we budgeted last year. We're gonna add 4% and this is what we'll budget next year. And you recognize that what you do and what we do in Oakland County is, here's what we budgeted for a year. Here's what we actually incurred, you know, the reality yeah. part. Yeah. Here's how much money came in. Here's how much money we expense. That forms the basis for going the to the next budget, year's right. budget. And so without the reality, you can budget the budget all day long. You can change three assumptions and you're balanced, um, so but you're not no really idea. balanced. They, well, it's, it's important reality. you say that because one of the things we've been saying is, you want us to do a multi-billion dollar deal and you don't have an audited financial statement. What's an audited financial statement? That's the statement where outside auditors and accountants come in and look at your books and say, yeah, this fairly represents the fiscal state of whatever entity that's being balanced. They don't have that. And we're told they don't have it because when the emergency manager came in, he looked around and said, these books are in terrible shape. I'm not going to sign off in uh, what's called a letter of representation saying this is fair and balanced, this is accurately reflects things, because you haven't convinced me that it is. And so on one hand, he won't sign it so you can't issue him under the state law. What does that mean to us? It means we can't trust the numbers that are out there. You wouldn't make a, you wouldn't make a decision to buy a house or a car without knowing the numbers. Right. How are we ever expected to tell our ratepayers this is a great deal for the next 40 years? You, your, your rates are going to go up, but we don't know how much. They're going to tell you 4%, but we know the system fails, and it fails shortly at 4%. Hmm. Um, but trust us, because we're here from the government to help you. We're not going to uh, do that. No, no. And the suburbs, I, I think, are right to say, just like Brooks said, no deal is better than a bad deal, right. correct? That's correct. And the deal that's on the table right now, is that still open to us where we could have representation on this new authority, um, correct? Actually, I was just told today that they're no longer interested in, the in new pursuing authority? the new authority. They're going oh, to be a go new plan. another way. So there's a new plan that perhaps comes out. What we have open to us, frankly, going forward is uh, the proactive steps the board just took. Um, you, and maybe uh, you can just, explain a little uh, bit to uh, the audience and uh, what what the board has done and what, where we're going with the, uh, the steps that we're taking now. Okay. Well, the, the reality is right now we're, we're kind of caught in a monopolistic system. There's between only rock, one game okay, in town. simple, between a rock and a hard uh, yes, place, right. right? They have a monopoly and they can impose a lot of things on the customers when there's only one game in town. Sure. So it's, well, let's see what other games might be out there today, but more importantly, what can be out there in five and 10 and 15 years? to make sure that, that we're not caught in this loop forever. Remember, you're asking me for a 40-year deal. Right. My idea isn't whether or not I can save you money for five years. My idea is what puts the county in the best position so that our communities have the option on how to proceed over the next four decades. And wow. so the board has just uh, authorized us to conduct that study, put some money behind it so we have some resources to get people who know in to do it. Um, you know, the world is full of uh, technical experts in water and sewer you know, across the globe. There's and mega it's companies changing that do all that. the time too well, with it new is. technology. You know, we're, we live in a place that's blessed with water, yeah. but right. there's a lot of places that aren't. And so they're very innovative with how to get water, how to save water, how to operate facilities at the lowest possible cost for the greatest return, those kind of things. And so 
we're going to, as a county, very aggressively go out there. We have some indication that Macomb wants to join us. Uh, we'll see what Wayne's going to do. Wayne has its own share of fiscal difficulties right now, so yeah. I, I don't know what they're, they're going to do there. But for the region's sake, and fairly for the state's sake, we have to do that. Now, let me throw this in, too, for the state. What's at stake here? You talked about being on a well and septic, so you're good. Well, just the tri-county area alone represents something in the neighborhood of 40% of the state's population. Yeah, that's a big chunk. 48% of its gross domestic product, if you will, the economy. 41% of the jobs. So imagine what happens to the state of Michigan if the water and sewer system fails in the southeastern Michigan. They can't afford it to fail. And so everybody has an obligation to look forward and see, can we save the system and at what cost? Can we improve the system and use alternative technologies? What's the cost? Let's stop talking and start doing it. But by everyone, you're including the state. I'm including the state of government Michigan. Government. In, I'm including the state in of Michigan. Too. I'm including the, not just the eight counties that the system touches. Um, yeah, I'm including everyone because it's that, it's that important. You know, the water supply, 20% of the world's fresh water supply, where we dump our waste, uh, they have a stake in it in Ohio and in New York. Sure. And all I the way think. out, you know, and yeah. another country's involved in that. So this is a very important issue. And it's underground, so we don't think about it a lot. Right. You know, when you flush your toilet, it goes away. Most people are done thinking about it. Well, you as a government leader can't afford to not think about it. Yeah, I, I guess I'm sort of reminded too, every time I go up north somewhere like Petoskey or Traverse City, they're so conscious of the water. You know, they they really are, um, they really want to protect their environment. You know, they consider it a, a privilege to live so close to the water and, um, and have all the great things that this water brings to their communities. And they're much more, uh, you know, they think about the water, I think a lot more than, than we do. You know, we don't even think we're, you know, we're, we're very close to a Great Lake, but we just don't think about the lakes and what happens to the lakes as a result of our water usage, right. correct? Right, yeah. it's familiarity. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. So, um, we haven't liked what's been proposed to us so mm. far. And the state hasn't really gotten actively involved, correct? Correct. Okay, um, what, going forward, what, what do you think, uh, the county anyway, what is our best plan? There's gotta be something that we can do where we are not going to be um, held captive by, the, by Detroit water and sewer, yeah. you know? It's what like most issues, there's multiple fronts. I mean, we've retained bankruptcy council because Oakland County does have some contracts as the county with the city. So we'll be in the bankruptcy court and are in it now with objections and trying to see the plans going forward. Uh, what the city's pursuing now is Detroit either continuing to operate the system as a department of the city, or they've put out what's known as an RFI, a request for information uh, to the private sector saying, tell us if you're interested in coming in to lease it, run it, um, own it. Um, and uh, they gave them something in the neighborhood of two whole weeks to decide whether or not two they weeks. wanted to get into a finalist list to do uh, what the next step, which is called the request for proposal. How could the you okay, even bid? Make us that? an offer. Well, you know, they're entitled to do that, and that's what they're proceeding with. We don't think, <laughs> it's private sector especially, we don't think any responsible person is going to come in and face what we faced in terms of the lack of financials, the lack of true knowledge about the state of the system and start committing private sector money and billions of dollars over long terms without doing a good job. And uh, so they're, they're trying to pursue that. Maybe they can hire somebody to come in and, and say, just pay us a flat fee to run it and then we'll run it and we'll charge whatever we need to charge. And we'll be under the rate payers. Uh, it's certainly one of the implied threats out there from what they want to do. In their bankruptcy plan, disclosure plan that they mm -hmm. filed with the court, we already know one thing they intend to do and that is to accelerate that billion dollar pension obligation by turning it into $675 million in payments over the next 10 years, charged to the suburban rate payers, oh. um, 67.5 million a year, uh, so they can take care of some of the remaining pension obligations for the general city retirement system, and at the same time, 
the city won't have to make a payment for 10 years into the system so they can use that money for other things. Again, what does that mean? It means they want us to pre-fund their retirement obligation to free up money in the city and you ratepayers get to pre-fund it. So I mean, we've, nobody we've been does very that. cautious and very careful about our pensions. You know, whenever we, you know, when we began to think about it years and years ago, maybe decades ago, we started a program, you know, like, you know, get off the defined benefit um, and, and start offering other options to our employees. And they get good benefits and everything, but even pensions, um, you know, they're, employees are having to participate more Absolutely. in their own benefit program. Right. So did they ever do that there? Um, their, their current pension plans are significantly more generous than what Oakland County employees are, are offered or have ever been offered. Yes. Hmm. Um, and, and again, those are things that? to be fixed. Yeah. Yes, they still. I mean, the, the, the employees are paying more towards their benefits than they've ever paid, but they're not paying anything like, frankly, what the county pays and certainly not anything near what private sector employers uh, hmm. have their employees pay. Well, I've always heard that, um, you know, we should be looking, I hear from the public out there who's, who really are looking for a simple fix and there's mm -hmm. no simple fix for this and they kind of realize how they're beginning to realize how big this problem is um, and they just say well can't we have a water tower you know in our community mm -hmm. wouldn't that help or you know wouldn't that help offset some of those costs mm -hmm. what what about things like that well that's part of the alternative study what can they do and I will say in my opinion the water is a much easier alternative than sewage is oh because sewage is there's not a lot of of local sewage, you're talking 710 million gallons of sewage a day flowing into the treatment facility from the whole area, from a thousand square miles of, of humans. Um, there are some smaller uh, places around, but these are places that are doing 15 or 20 million gallons a day in treatment. So you see how big the issue yeah. is. It's very expensive. And then there's that little technical thing called gravity, you know? Yeah. The more you have to pump fluid, the more expensive it is, the more pumps you need. And uh, the sewage is already literally flowing downhill. And, and for Oakland County, like yeah. we're at the headwaters, meaning at the highest point for six river systems in the state. And wow. so we have gravity issues to address as well. So I know they've always told us we in Novi had to pay more because we're uphill from right. Detroit. Right, when the water, so, you're pumping the water uphill yeah, to get there. Uphill. So yes, it costs more money. I mean, isn't there some way, it seems like, you know, we could do something partially in our communities that, well, maybe what if we took care of our own sewage? I don't know how that would happen, but what if we did that and then bought water or yeah. vice versa? Maybe we... Well, it, again, and, and these are all things to look at. Flint has taken great steps, Flint and Genesee County, to get off the Detroit system. They finally got permitted uh, to do a, a water line from the lake from Lake St. Clair over to Genesee County. They already had a, a system, a water treatment system that they had mothballed. They just got a permit to take water from the Flint River again to start uh, dealing with their water supply. Mm -hmm. And here's an interesting thing that people probably don't think of, and that is the water and sewer system is a business that has fixed costs essentially. Mm -hmm. you, know, you need $100 a year to run your system. You know, if I get my $100 a year, from 10 people, everybody's paying $10. If one of the people leave and take their $10 away, next year, I still need $100 to run the system. So you're gonna get $11 you're gonna owe me. Yeah. And so if every time somebody breaks away, there's a cost to the system and your rates are gonna go up if you're still in the system. Every time we do conservation work to reduce the amount that people use, it doesn't have a dollar for dollar savings on the cost side. So what you do is you're going to affect rates. The rates will go up to cover the fixed costs you need, even though you're sending out millions of gallons less. Hmm. And, and when you get into the, the, the big numbers, for instance, the city right now is, according to their last financial reports, they're, they're billing something in the neighborhood of 63 million gallons um, a day for the city. Inside the city system, because of the leaks and what have you, they're losing 150 million gallons yeah, a day. I mean, all this past so winter we saw all this water. That tells you, and it happens you know, in a lot of places, yeah. but it tells you the condition of the system is yeah. at risk and it's critical and it needs work. But it also shows the, the amount of, of, of churn in your rate base that you could have by 
even if I save 150 million gallons and stop it completely, I'm still going to have to charge for the 63 and I'm still going to have to charge 100% of the cost because I got to spread the fixed costs across the system. So there's huge challenges involved in how to do it. That's why we're looking at new technology, you know, newer systems, newer ways of doing business um, to help us solve that because we all in if, the end have to have affordable rates. Yeah, if our suburbs uh, pipes and our underground infrastructure is newer, is considerably newer than Detroit's, what if we just hooked up with another newer system and say we joined Flint. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one of the options you might even look at. Yeah, that's one of the options are what other systems exist out there that can be enhanced or expanded so they can feed us um, uh, both water or perhaps take the sewage. Maybe the sewage answer is package treatment plants around the county. Um, they are far smaller in scale. They do, you know, a city or two. They do even a subdivision or two. Where's the break even point to make that too expensive in light of what's happening in the city. Now I know whatever option, like say we were to choose an option and decided to go that way, um, and Detroit Water and Sewer says, well, you know what then, we're just cutting you off, uh, you know, if you're going to follow this, you know, we're going to punish you for doing something else. Is that also out there somewhere? Of course it is. Uh, it just ask Flint. Flint just got a, uh, they're not ready to go yet and will take years to completely break away. But effective April 1st, they had a nice hike in their rates and they'll have a subsequent hike in their rates in July. Because remember, from the city's viewpoint, it's not the city necessarily being evil, it's I've got a fixed cost system yeah. and I've got to spread the cost of the system. And if you're gonna be on the system and it costs me X amount of dollars to take care of you in whatever capacity, I'm gonna charge you that plus. Well, and I've heard um, reports that there's something like 85% of the people in Detroit are not paying their water yeah. bills. Yeah. I mean, the, that's an the, the, estimate, I suppose, but... Well, the, the, it's pretty hard numbers in terms of they have a huge delinquency problem. There's $170 million, I believe, in delinquent retail payments. 140 million of them are more than 60 days delinquent. All right, wow. it's about, it's primarily the retail system is primarily in the city and something in the neighborhood of 80% of their accounts are delinquent. Now, they're delinquent for a lot of reasons. Sure. I mean, Detroit is a poor city. They have, they have people who can't pay. And people that probably don't trust. And then they have people who right? choose not to pay because nothing happened to the people who don't pay. Right. Uh, as I said, Highland Park yeah. hasn't paid in three years. Wow. Um, so the, as a government, are we going to turn off people who are truly needy who can't pay because they have no money? Are you going to stop water and sewer services? Of course you're no. not. And nobody, I don't think, is really going to really argue that you could. So you have to figure out a way to make those who can pay, pay, but you also have to have a support system, all right? And our argument to the state has been, that it hasn't been followed up on too much yet, is it's not just the responsibility of the people in the system today who pay to help all these people. We're not the only ones who have to help with their Medicaid. We're not the only ones who have to help with their unemployment. No, this is a statewide problem you need to set up up here. We need other tools to help them get what they need without crushing the people who, who pay their bills. Yeah, it seems like we always get punished out here. You know, you have to kind of subsidize in a variety of ways. And, and people are okay with subsidizing for, for really needy um, individuals or families or whatever. But, you know, it seems like you reach a point where, look at, we're helping as much as we can. When do we you know, stop being punished yeah. for, for being good uh, neighbors and good citizens because yeah. we're paying our bills? You know, the, it's a basic rule of insurance oh. that you spread the risk of loss over the largest group. That's why you and I buy car insurance. Yep. We don't pay what a claim is. We pay premiums and then you put all the premiums together and there's a pool of money to pay losses from. This is really no different. The city of Detroit finds itself in bankruptcy. A lot of people will blame a lot of reasons, but the reality is we're here. So we're yeah. here, and so who has to fix it? Is it just the people in the city? Is it just the people in the tri-county area? Is it the state? Is it the federal government? I suppose people can differ on the answer, but my answer is the federal government needs to be here, the state needs to be here, the people in the area Everybody. need to be here, right. and so far that's not really happening in, in reality. Um, you can talk about $350 million, for instance, to help save the art. Yeah. All right. 
uh, I need $5 billion in repairs um, over the next 10 years for the system, and at least a billion and a half, we know from their own admission, is in the city of Detroit who is in no position to pay. They absolutely won't have the money to do that. Why aren't we throwing some money at that? Yeah. Hmm. Well, you know, I, I know that we could go on and on and talk about, you know, what the different options are, but I like the idea that we are at least taking a look at, at a variety of things, or we're going to be taking a look, which to me is to do it responsibly is going to take a bit of time. You know, they seem to be in crisis mode there, and uh, Kevin Orr is not going to be there forever, so what kind of what kind of pressure are we experiencing from them to come on, sign on now? Well, we've had probably five lines in the stand, decide, decide, decide. Yeah. Um, we had a conversation last night with one of the negotiators who says the new line of the stand is July 17th. Oh, this sounds Well, we've had, yeah. we'd had a November date and a December date in January. So, um, you know, what we'd like to do is what the free press asks. Why not make a deal that benefits the entire region? Right. We, we think we would, but the deal that's on the table doesn't benefit anybody except creditors of the city of Detroit now. And by the way, as far as I'm concerned, that doesn't help the city residents who are there. No. They need something to help them as well. And for the ones who pay their bills, and many try to pay their bills, many do pay their bills, they're going to get hooked on this too. Are fundamentally at odds over simply this. We need to take every dollar we can get and put it in the system because it literally has billions of dollars in need. They want to take money out of the system to take care of other things and then let you address this a different way. And we're saying you just, you just can't afford that. We can't afford that as a state, as a region, as a tri-county area. The city can't afford it because, oh, by the way, if they don't have the money to fix the system, they're not going to have water and sewer services for their people either. And so we no. need something fair that benefits. But our primary view is you keep the money you have in the system to fix the system. Hmm. Well, I know it's a perplexing thing. And I, I, I know that we um, on the Board of Commissioners have really been perplexed about this. And I, you've been involved in it in a much uh, broader way than we have, and it's taken a lot of your time and actually Oakland County's administration time. So uh, the bottom line here is that Brooks thinks it's a bad deal. You think it's a bad deal, the one that's the last one that was on the table. Right. And um, we're hoping that we're going to get more people involved in this, such as the federal government, the state government. I don't know how we can wake all those people up because they're dealing with a lot of other problems. But um, is there anything we citizens in the suburbs can do? I think yes. I think you can talk to your state legislators and let them know that this is an issue that's important to them. Because the other half of this 40% of the state's population, in theory, means we're 40% of the state legislative delegations. Yeah. And they have to know that this is an important issue that needs assistance from the state. I'm not saying the state should pay everything or even most things, but they can certainly assist. They could change the law so the state could become the party that forms the authority. Mm. And then they, could, then they could underwrite debt, all right? Because a lot of this is who guarantees the debt determines the, the interest rate you, you oh. charge. So if the sure. credit of the state is on the line, then the state has the incentive to make sure that the rate payers are paying their bills. Wall Street can look at who's back in the debt in case the, the, the folks can't afford to pay, and that's one way they could benefit, that, that our plea to do that has fallen on deaf ears. There's, there's many ways to assist, but it's going to take everybody being in the game. Yeah, you know, I've heard Brooks say this before the, about, you know, we can't just forget about Detroit because everything, it, you know, it really does affect the region. What goes on in Detroit affects us immensely. It affects our economic uh, advantages. You know, we're trying to get businesses here. You know, what goes on with the DIA and the zoo and all that, those are things that attract people to our area as well as our workforce and everything. So we need for Detroit to succeed in many ways. We need for them to be viable, you know, and, and to come back to a certain extent for sure. We can't save them ourselves. The suburbs can't necessarily save them. But it does affect us 
what's going on there really does affect us. Well, you and I both know that political talk and rhetoric aside, Oakland County has never advocated the banning the city. No. No county in the state does more for its local units of government and for the regional units of government than Oakland County does in terms of money, in terms of assistance. I mean, it means something when we say we're the only donor, donor county in the state, yeah. we pay more to the state in taxes than we get back. Well, that money goes to every place else in the state that gets more back than they put in, one of which is the city. But we've been there on transit for them, and we've been there on the zoo, and we've been there on the DIA, and we're there on economic development things that are invisible to most people. And so the old rhetoric about you want to abandon the city is not true. There's this thing called law out there, and maybe your constituents don't know, but it's actually unconstitutional in Michigan for a government to give a gift. All right? So you can't just gift taxpayers' money to another unit of government, to a company, to a city, to a person. You have to get a fair exchange of value. It's been the law since 1838. It'll be the law for another century. All right? So mm -hmm. there are frameworks within which we operate. And so we are there. And uh, we just won't be unfairly taken advantage of, and we won't pay tribute. No. Well, well Jerry, I, I got to tell you, this has really been uh, eye-opening for, I hope it's been eye-opening to all of our audience. I'm sure it has. It may be a lot more information than they ever wanted to know. But because um, they're going to be getting their bills, you know, their yeah. water bills and their sewer bills are definitely going up. Yeah. We, we don't even have any idea how much. Yeah and it's gonna be just a guess. So I think people have to be prepared and should really be more knowledgeable about what the history is and, um, and the fact that we are working hard to find some options that will, you know, not that we're gonna ever solve this problem, but certainly options that are gonna make it better for our citizens in the suburbs and hopefully will help Detroit as well. So um, is there anything else you'd like to tell us or no, I, I think that's a, enough good news for the day. <laughs> I think you're right, too. It's not really that great. But anyway, I want to thank you so much for sure. coming. I just think it's really been uh, wonderful that you've been able to sort of give us this big picture of view in such a short period of time. So I want to thank our viewing audience, too, for tuning in. And, uh, you know, every month we have very interesting programs, and there's lots of information that is for you. So I hope that... Uh, you'll have a chance to, maybe the first time you watch it, you're not really gonna catch everything that we said that is going to affect you, but you watch again and it'll become a little more enlightening, hopefully. So um, thanks for tuning in and uh, thanks to you, Jerry, Thank you for, for showing up for the, the show. Thanks a lot. Be good.